In 2004, a small six-person studio in Australia began working on a 1940s Los Angeles-based detective game for Sony. The team spent a year and a half researching Los Angeles, accurately assessing its buildings, its history through newspapers, and its traffic routes. They poured money into cutting-edge facial animation technology, utilizing 32 separate cameras placed at various angles to accurately capture facial features of the game's characters to a stunning degree. They hired on over 400 actors to fill the roles that the script demanded. The game would go on to be the only title which Team Bondi would ever release, though its impact on the gaming industry made a lot of waves for a new IP. After seven years of development, the transfer of the publishing to Rockstar and a staggering $50 million budget, L.A. Noir hit the shelves in May of 2011. Responses were very positive, with much of the praise directed at the sheer magnitude of detail in the facial animations. And that's what many people, myself included, seem to think of first when they think of L.A. Noir. With the amount of effort put into those animations, it really isn't a bad thing for it to be regarded as the primary aspect of the game. Still, even though the game did well, a lot of ugly internal conflict between Team Bondi and Rockstar surfaced soon after L.A. Noir's release. Former staff came out against Team Bondi, citing unfair and abusive working conditions. An anonymous source claimed that Rockstar was the only thing that saved L.A. Noir, as Team Bondi's direction would falter constantly throughout development. Testimonials piled up, which were refuted by the higher-ups at Bondi and ultimately any potential sequels for the game seemed to be prematurely snuffed out. Still, regardless of what came after, what we got was a beautifully stylized slice of a time and place in history that isn't often seen covered in video games. Its soundtrack was tailor-made to suit its dramatic tones. Its attention to detail was something that I hadn't been accustomed to seeing very frequently at the time. It planted an intrigue in me of a time period that I didn't really care too much about and a job that I hadn't really ever been particularly interested in. But part of me knows that there were lackluster aspects of L.A. Noir, things that I wrote off and erased from my mind, or just didn't have the same standards for. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about what L.A. Noir does right, and what could have been done better. I'll be playing through the game and picking out what I like and dislike about its story, characters, mechanics, and so on before wrapping up everything into my conclusion. As such, there will be spoilers for quite a large chunk of the game's cases, and I encourage you to play this game yourself if you're concerned about that kind of thing. Alright, let's start. Our introduction begins on the backdrop of an industrious period in Los Angeles' history. Houses being built, busy streets with bustling people trying to make it big in a Hollywood-fueled era, the boom of commerce after the birth and spread of the automobile, the so-called American dream being portrayed in a way that so many people of that time fondly look back on. We're put in the shoes of an up-and-coming LAPD officer by the name of Cole Phelps who served in the Marines during World War II before settling in as a patrol officer on the force. Our first mission has us playing as Phelps during the case that started him down the path of creating his reputation as someone with an eye for smaller details that others don't tend to see. After arriving on a scene of a murder, the game walks you through what a typical mystery might look like. You can pick through various objects, examine them, and jot down details if they're potentially related to the case that you're on, all of which feels very immersive. Immersion is the name of the game with L.A. Noir, and it tends to expertly bring it to the table during the majority of your playthrough. Though that said, by default, the game does help guide you through your clue-gathering endeavors by playing a musical chime whenever you're near a clue. In a time where games hadn't quite settled on the miraculous bright outline of specific objects of importance, this chime wasn't a horrible alternative to outright marking items with gaudy contours which felt more gamey. Still, the chime can shake you out of your immersion pretty easily when you don't know what it's directing you towards, as it tends to play repeatedly as you circle the entity that it wants you to interact with. You can turn off this option if you so choose, but it makes for a much tougher game when Cole will suddenly notice something up on the rooftops that the average person might not spot. So the alternative to using the chime is mashing A constantly or attempting to scour every nook and cranny with the hopes of noticing this sort of obscure detail yourself. I could see somebody preferring this style of gameplay, though I think it would get a little frustrating to me personally. So after discovering the possible murder weapon being tossed on the rooftop, Cole's partner wants to call it in and let the higher-ups take care of the rest. Cole is ambitious, though, and insists that the two head to the local gun store in the hopes of tracing the weapon back to the suspect. This is where the driving comes in, and the concept of what the open world looks like when compared to other Rockstar games. Driving is completely inaccurate to say the least, as your vehicle turns on a dime at the slightest nudge of the control stick. 
It isn't slippery, but it is flawed when compared to how a real-world vehicle would function. If you're expecting to have to make up for large amounts of speed by turning sooner, you're going to turn into a sidewalk. You can often turn directly down a road without the handbrake or slowing down. It's extraordinarily arcadey and definitely takes some getting used to if you're expecting this older car to drive any more accurately to the real world than it does. The game doesn't give you a lined GPS-inspired minimap which Rockstar games tend to brandish, and instead just points you to a general area where you're attempting to make it to. You can ask your partner to call out when the next turn is along the road, which is actually pretty fun in its own right, all things considered. So what about the open world? When you think of a typical Rockstar game, there's always that moment when you decide, yeah, I'm just gonna start jumping off of buildings and shooting people and robbing places and hitting pedestrians. Right? That's, that's not just me, right? I swear it's a normal thing to do in these games. <clears throat> Anyways. Being a part of the LAPD immediately curbs that kind of behavior, as hitting pedestrians, causing damage to property or the like, causes Cole to suffer penalty fees from his job. If you rack up enough damage, this will also affect your case score or will outright cause the mission to fail if you happen to kill an innocent. Now, all of that said, outside of these cases, eh, yeah, that shit doesn't really matter. The game does restrict you to being able to pull out your weapon or punching out civilians at random, but you can always hop into your vehicle to cause carnage if you really want to. It's probably the only Rockstar game where you can't just raise hell across the city, likely because it wasn't developed in-house by the studio. Honestly though, even if Cole could suddenly just pull out a Tommy gun and start wasting people in the streets, I really have no desire to the same way that I did with Trevor or CJ or Arthur due to who Cole is and what his profession entails. Heading to the gun shop has us looking through the ledger for this custom-ordered weapon that someone decided to chuck instead of keeping with them, leading us to our primary suspect. Driving over to the suspect's apartment has us getting into the fisticuffs tutorial, as the guy resists arrest, claiming that he did nothing wrong. Brawling in this game is about as invigorating as it has been for about 20 years of Rockstar Games, as mashing the A button has us bopping the guy before he can get a hit off before throwing him on the ground and knocking him out. I will say that Red Dead 2 was probably the first game of the past two decades to at least make this whole process a little more cinematic, so I guess I was a little unfair there, but L.A. Noir still showcases the basics, which doesn't really feel the best to work with in all honesty. Still, we sweep the guy's apartment for clues, which really portrays the shittier side of clue investigation. Team Bondi's method of creating unimportant clues involved scattering random objects like apples, coffee mugs, cigarettes, and the like throughout the area and playing the chime to give you the hope that you might have stumbled onto something worthwhile, only to have Phelps wrangling a coffee mug and flipping it every which way before stating that it wasn't important. After calling in the arrest, the two officers pack it in for the night, which leads to a cutscene depicting a glimpse of Cole's past of trying to locate a bus to take him and his buddies where they were to be stationed during the war. After watching a stereotypical drill sergeant chew out the group just because that's the norm for the Marines, you're immediately dumped into the next case, which involves an active robbery near Cole's vicinity. This is your shooting tutorial, which is also standard Rockstar shooting. Sit and cover, pop out, blast them, move up. It's nothing extraordinary, though the carnage from watching a shotgun tear up the back of an armed robber is always fun to watch. After dispatching the gang, you're then pushed back into Cole's past, which is a little more jarring after a brief three-minute sequence. It does make sense on paper, though. Play a mission, reveal a bit of Cole's past, play a mission, reveal a bit more. But when it comes to talking about the game with any semblance of linearity, it's pretty disruptive. So let's do it this way. I'm gonna hop through these tutorial cases and then jump back over to the plot after they've wrapped up. Our next case has us pursuing someone who skipped bail and immediately takes off down an alleyway as he's recognized by Cole's partner. This puts us into the pursuit tutorial, which again is not the greatest. The thing that Rockstar games have always thrived off of is creating a story and an environment where chasing a subject or getting into a shootout or speeding down the road is a lot more cinematic and interesting to play through than the mechanics themselves entail. Yeah, you might as well be playing through a walking sim during a particular chase, but it's enhanced by the idea of bearing down on a bad guy or shaking down a former associate or beating the shit out of someone that you've gotten to know as a character. In this case, the chase is made more palatable by the 1947 LA environment with its grimy buildings, occupied back alleys, and darker lighting. The suspect is cut off from exiting the alley by your partner and has to escape up to the rooftops before he clotheslines Cole from around the side of a structure. 
None of this is particularly riveting from a sheer mechanics perspective, but that feeling drowns away when these other details enhance the chase to become better than it actually is. So what could they have done differently? Well, with the way that the mechanics of the game are structured, not too much. Maybe beyond having the guy pull out a gun on the rooftops. Maybe Cole decides that he wants to take the guy alive and has to aim for an arm or leg. But even that isn't super interesting and actually is something that you can do later. You'd have to have vaulting and jumping mechanics in place, maybe a dodge action or a way to call out to the perpetrator mid-pursuit in the hopes that he'll give up without a fight if the correct choices are picked. But without any of that, I would say that the shortcomings here were made up for with the environment and intrigue for now. That may shift later once I get used to what 1947 LA looks like though. Finally, we have the case that makes Cole. Another murder, though this one happens with an earshot of Phelps. By the time he rushes to the scene, there's only a body. Cole can take the initiative once again to try to see what he can figure out before the higher-ups make their way over, which has us examining the body for any leads and questioning a nearby witness. Much like the previous Clue investigation stuff, examining bodies tends to lead to the same kind of superfluous scrutiny of arms and heads before you can find the evidence. Even the game encourages you to shake the guy's head around like an arcade machine joystick at first. Rifling through the victim's pockets has us finding a bill for a pair of earrings which a woman was paying off at the time. That woman happens to be our witness, who immediately showcases what shitty lying looks like in this game. She claims that she has no idea what happened, only that her boss happened to get shot. When you call her out while presenting the evidence of her knowing the prime suspect, she corrects her story a bit which leads us into more questioning. It's a pretty straightforward but very effective and satisfying gameplay system. You call out lies when you have the correct evidence to back up your accusations. You doubt them when you don't have enough evidence, but can see that the person is making a face like Pee Wee Herman has merged with Mr. Bean. No, I didn't go anywhere near that car. What are you, what are you doing with your face? What is that? All right, I'm going to look over the evidence in my book here and... and <laughs> Stop, stop doing that! Okay, missing plates, missing wheel, wrench. Oh, come on! Oh, come on! Would you stop looking at me like that? Holy shit! You, you, oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, someone's dead. And you pick the truth option when everything adds up and seems transparent. This system is the bread and butter of L.A. Noir, the crowning jewel that everyone remembers. Interrogating people, questioning them about clues, and confronting them with evidence is probably the peak of what this game is in my eyes. It takes all of the effort that you put into looking around and allows you to put the stuff that you found to use, solving one mystery after another by putting all of the pieces together. The whole system is pretty damn good, and reminds me heavily of what the Ace Attorney games have been bringing to the table for decades now. After you get the story as straight as you can get it and chase down the lead suspect, it's now time for a confession, which is more or less the ultimate form of the interrogation system. Basically, you're taking all of the evidence and testimonies that you've procured and using them to try to nail down the suspect into admitting fault. Because the stakes are higher here, the game encourages you to use the intuition system to eliminate wrong answers. Basically, as you work through the game and get promoted, you gain intuition points. Intuition can be used to help point out clues around an investigation area, eliminate one wrong answer during interrogations, or to pull the community to see which answer is the right option. Of course, you can forego using the intuition system if you like, allowing you to save your points until you need them. The points are replenished by ranking up, meaning that there are a limited amount of points that you can nab throughout the game. Alright, let's jump back into Cole's past now that we've received our promotion to detective. This whole string of cutscenes show what Phelps was about during the war, and introduces the idea of his rival by the name of Jack Kelso. Phelps was always a man of action, one who wanted to take the starry ideals derived from American propaganda and ingratiate those values into himself and the war as someone who made a difference. Kelso sees that attitude as a load of crap, insisting that Phelps is going to get his men killed with that frame of mind. As such, Phelps continues to be a Boy Scout and earns the respect of the Marines during his training and Kelso consistently comes in last when it comes to leadership scoring and the like, leading to an outburst where Kelso claims that he just wanted to fight for his country without this merit system getting in the way. It definitely sets up Cole as a straight-laced, by-the-books type of person, which he carries into his jobs as an LAPD officer and a detective. 
After being assigned a new partner and getting placed in the traffic division, it becomes clear that Cole's new colleagues are a lot more loose and easygoing than Cole is, showing a natural divide between them and the hardworking and go-getting former Marine. The game now opens up a bit more, though not in the traditional Rockstar fashion. You're still always technically on a case. You can just choose to free roam if you like. You can also go into the menus and find the free roam option, but you can't do it from directly in the game. That said, there really isn't too much to do at the moment besides respond to a street crime, which involves a silly fella who's just waving a gun around on a rooftop. Either way, we're going to get into what a lot of the rest of this game is going to look like, which has the detectives pulling up on a car which has been caked with blood from the inside. Investigating the marked evidence has us finding a bloody water heater pipe, a wallet with an address and identification, a receipt for a pig carcass, and a pair of broken glasses. Pulling up to the potential victim's residence has us meeting with the wife before snooping around for more clues. The misdirection here is at an all-time high, as investigation points us towards an unhappy marriage and the possible murder weapon being taken from a new water heater installation. The only unexplained bit here is that pig carcass receipt, which probably seems like a minor detail to a new player. The first time I played, I was certain that the wife was the murderer, and that she was trying to get rid of her husband as their marriage fell apart. And honestly, the interrogation system has a major downside here that I didn't mention previously that helped me lean into that conclusion. So as with any game that has a very simple set of dialogue options, Ellie Noir's truth, lie, and doubt system really obscures the choice that you're about to make until you make it. You don't know what Cole is going to say. You only know the vague premise of what he might accuse the suspect of. So take this example. The glasses found at the scene of the crime were broken and repaired by the victim with some tape. The wife here states that the victim had just bought some brand new ones, and then he headed out to work with them on before disappearing. That sticks out to me because the ones that we found at the crime scene were refurbished. But instead of being able to quiz the wife about whether the victim had kept the old glasses or not, calling her bluff leads to Cole immediately yelling out that the wife was in on the murder. And this is the problem with this system. Not knowing what the doubt option is going to have Cole saying in the slightest means that the extreme accusations like this are going to fly without warning. If I could instead bring up the evidence that I found and ask the suspect what she meant when she said her husband had bought some new glasses, it would clear up any misunderstanding that might have arisen from this interrogation. So while you can choose to meet with the victim's work colleague before talking to the wife and generally approach this whole case the way that you want to, the interrogation system is a lot more rigid in how you tackle it. You can't gather evidence or learn new things as fluidly as you can when snooping around a home or a crime scene. And instead, we have to tiptoe a lot more carefully through what probably should be the most flexible part of information acquisition. A conversation should have many avenues that you can take to arrive at a moment of clarity. But L.A. Noir takes that concept and forces the player to make the one right answer. And this only makes the game more frustrating as time goes on. Ironically, the press X to doubt meme that lived on well past the game's lifespan was probably the biggest issue with the entire game's conversation system, as its utility wasn't to doubt as much as it was to verbally manhandle and intimidate the suspect. Which makes complete sense seeing as the game was developed using the options of coax, force, and accuse. Fortunately, the remastered edition of this game does do this better as truth, doubt, and lie are replaced with good cop, bad cop, and accuse, which I think definitely better reflects what's about to happen. It's still not the optimal solution of knowing what Phelps is going to say, but knowing the tone of what I'm picking in these scenarios at least helps me to better choose the dialogue during interrogations. You keep lying to me, and I'll send you and your baby to jail. Either way, the wife here is telling the whole truth. And it turns out that the husband had his co-worker use the pig carcass to make it look like he was beaten so that the guy could skip town on his wife to be with a lady in Seattle. Of course, it wouldn't be case closed without a chase sequence, so we have to chase the most athletic dad-bodied man that I've ever seen across the rooftops before he gives up and we take him in. With no doubt of the guy's motives, we skip the interrogation this time. And that's a wrap on Cole's first case as a detective. The end screen to each mission features your case report, which grades you based off of the number of questions that you got correct and the clues that you found. Of course, injuries to civilians plus property and vehicle damage will dock you some points, but you can still make some mistakes and swing a 5-star rating. And again, this is the difference in structuring between this game and, say, GTA or Red Dead. The game may seem like your typical open-world foray, but it really is more of a quest-based stage-to-stage kind of game. 
So most of the traffic desk cases aren't super compelling to the point where I need to describe every single one in explicit detail. They are quite fun to play through and have a fair amount of intrigue to them, but they don't really play into the overarching plot of the game beyond showcasing Cole's continued rise in the force. You got a brand new car which turns up abandoned in someone's yard, which is traced back to the consulate of Argentina. You fuck young boys, Valdez. Are you a madman? You have a hit and run accident where it turns out that the victim was dead before he was actually hit by the car. There's a stolen vehicle racket which has us terrorizing someone innocent before we figure out that they were also a victim of a car theft ring. And the last mission is actually worth delving into, just because it shows off one of the better cases that this game has to offer. The crime involves two females in the movie industry, one of which is an actual star and the other who's a 15-year-old runaway who's trying to make it big in Hollywood. After the star took the younger apprentice under her wing, she dropped the 15-year-old off at a director's place before she was taken advantage of sexually. The two were drugged and shoved into a car before the gas pedal was forced down, taking the vehicle off of a cliff. They survived the crash, but now it's clear that the star wants revenge for the attempted murder, which she calls her husband to arrange. The lead up to this call has us carefully tailing the star, ducking into a booth and pretending to read a newspaper, all of which makes up a really fun bit of this game. Even though it sounds like the piece of shit deserves it, we have to try to stop this vengeance from being inflicted on the director, which has us rushing to his apartment. Turns out that this guy's been taken already and his wife confesses to her husband liking young girls, casting out any doubts about his involvement there. So here's the hitch. The star has been blackmailing the director with a film of him and the 15-year-old, and that caused him to snap and try to kill them both. We find this out after investigating a set with a camera tucked away behind a one-way mirror, filming a room that contains an open bottle of chloral hydrate. When we go to book the owner of the film set, a vice detective pops onto the scene to claim that the owner is an informant, and therefore protected from persecution. Hold on a moment. This is clearly a vice case. You've been roughing up my informant? Hopgood is a vice informer? Yes, he is, Phelps, and a very important one. Look at that mug. Have you been upsetting these two officers, Marlon? After we race to another set where our director is supposed to be hiding out at, we chase down the 44-year-old and yet another display of someone who's ridiculously athletic for their age. The whole thing concludes in a shootout between the star's husband's gangsters and the LAPD, with explosions from oil barrels dotting the scene throughout. This entire case does wonders at displaying the darkest side of the City of Angels. Underage abuse, murderous intent in the name of revenge, blackmail, and dirty cops who want someone as clean-cut as Cole to stay out of their business. The two officers working the case do all of this to protect a pedophile so that they can ship him off to a prison. And it only gets more fucked up in the epilogue to this mission, which has the guy from Vice, Roy Earl, taking Phelps and his partner out to a nightclub. Hi, Elsa. Here's someone I'd like you to meet. Cole Phelps, war hero and crime fighter extraordinaire. And why would I want to meet another fascist from the LAPD? Who do you think you're talking to, you German junkie whore? Don't you ever forget your place with me again. Do you hear me? Meet Dr. Harlan Fontaine, doctor to the stars. Mr. Fix-It to the mental wreckage of Hollywood. It's a twisted depiction that you can't really help but see the shades of reality in, as its heavy tone is only the setup for a lot of the rest of this game, as Cole Phelps has now been promoted to the homicide desk. A lot of the characters that we just saw are going to be major players for the finale of L.A. Noir, but I'll skip talking about them in any depth for now. Throughout our time on the traffic desk, there were also quite a few more street crimes which basically are just busy work to raise your rank. Stuff like gang shootouts, robberies, hostage situations, chasing a lunatic across the city, and so on. There are 40 of these things and they absolutely suck until about, I don't know, the halfway mark. There's nothing fascinating about them. They're 100% filler with the purpose of padding this game with more experience gain and are the equivalent of fetch quests in an MMO. I mean, I guess they're realistic if you're just doing random street crime type stuff. So it's kind of hard to compare their humdrum nature to something like going to fetch some herbs from some random bush or whatever, but still, they're not the most fun to play through. I will say that I can't help but critique the audio mixing of a lot of the side characters that we talk to, though. Phelps and the main cast, for the most part, tend to be fine as far as that goes, but it feels like nearly every cop who you get info from tends to sound like they're talking into a closet, which is a lot more distracting when they're outdoors. We have an owner for the car? The car is registered to an Adrian Black. Yes, sir. The car has flags. 
Might be some kind of diplomatic vehicle. Where is the owner? He stepped out. Somebody had to take Lorna, Mrs. Patterson, home. I think the more interesting bits of offhand conversation which stems from the traffic desk cases revolve around a lot of casual racism, repression of women, and persecution of religion which was all common in this era of time. While a lot of it isn't super compelling or thought-provoking, the accuracy of the casual remarks made when dealing with different ethnicities and the like catch me off guard. And I am glad that they're here to accurately represent the time which the game takes place in. It makes the moments of reflection all the more powerful when you have someone like Cole who isn't inherently racist by any means, but has made his way through life being looked towards as a model American who's fought for his country and continues to serve it as an ideal citizen. Hey, if he'd been black or Hispanic, you'd be singing a different tune. You spout all this communist crap about treating everybody the same, but it only works one way. I'm not sure that's communism, Stefan. Oh, God, please. Not another history lesson from the man who single-handedly won the war. Are you finished? Yes. I feel much better now. We'll shake down the car dealer and take it from there. Unless his daddy plays golf with yours, of course. In which case, we'll give him a firm gentleman's handshake and be on our way. See? I knew you weren't finished. The homicide desk cases begin with a bang, as Phelps is put on a killing that bears resemblance to the infamous Black Dahlia murder. As such, arriving on the scene reveals the corpse of a naked woman who's been bludgeoned, sliced across the face, and written on with lipstick. Which, uh, isn't something I particularly want to show any of on YouTube. But this is the kind of sick shit that you can expect to encounter from here on out. This whole case is an allusion to a real-world crime which happened soon after the initial Black Dahlia slang, known as the Lipstick Murder. I think some of the most interesting stuff that comes out of the dialogue here is just how befuddled the police force is by Black Dahlia. It's one of the most infamous and sinister cases in the history of the modern US, one that was never solved. And hearing your partner theorize that it was probably a war vet who went crazy after being able to wholesale kill overseas and coming back to rejoin society is definitely one of the better theories out there. Of course, Phelps is excited to attempt to crack the case himself, which gets him scoffed at by his new partner who has little patience for Cole seemingly thinking that the world revolves around him. This whole ordeal isn't actually the most complex case by any means, and in terms of what happens during it, I'd almost describe it as run-of-the-mill. But that's the grotesque beauty of the homicide desk. You're not driving up on an abandoned vehicle or tracing a stolen ride. You're investigating a brutal killing, and that alone brings enough intrigue without needing to make the case have a crazy twist. An interesting thing to note here is that you don't always need to complete every single task in a mission to succeed with five stars. I found it surprising because I straight up left a potential suspect in lockup down at the station and jumped straight to the primary suspect, and that solved the case with no loss in ranking. I have mixed emotions there, as it is kind of cool that the game didn't penalize me for skipping part of it, but at the same time, I didn't see an entire scene and complete a whole investigation and still got the top rank. It's just kind of a weird bit of structuring there, I guess. At any rate, the cases from here on out are very similar in nature, and warrant a little more detail than the traffic deaths just because they're all connected into a big arc. Throughout it, there's almost a statement made by the game about how our society functions with the overreporting of heinous crimes which is something that still happens even today. With the Black Dahlia murder, everyone and their mother heard about what happened to Elizabeth Short on that night in 1947. It was heavily covered, and it's speculated that the coverage led to the lipstick murderer choosing to inscribe the words Fuck You BD on their victim's body. At the start of the next case, the victim is killed in nearly the exact same manner as the previous one, which the LAPD speculate to be the fault of the press deciding to report every single detail of a horrible crime. Without getting too sidetracked here, I personally think that this type of reporting where the public now knows the killer's name, face, history, method of killing, and so on is an absolutely stupid decision that only glorifies and inspires other would-be killers to do their best to match or outdo other big-time criminals. But the public eats this shit up, and reports with explicit details get clicks, views, and so on. And the fact that I'm now thinking about this sort of thing because of the historical accuracy of this game is another really cool byproduct of playing through L.A. Noir. The second case has a slight intricacy in the fact that we can quite easily pin the blame of the murder on a child molester who had enough evidence on him to get the charge to stick, which is also a really cool possibility here. On the other hand, we have just as much evidence that could point towards the husband of the victim. Hell, possibly more. But the idea here is that you can abuse your position a bit to frame someone else who you feel might deserve it more. Which is another concept that harkens to how a lot of the real world functions at times. It's a great case in its own right. 
and only continues to ramp up the expectations going forward. Round three, of course, involves another naked dead woman, but this time the killer has gotten a lot more brazen, pointing towards the idea that our last two arrests weren't correct. It becomes clear that the murderer also wants to leave a message, even going so far as to paint a trail of blood through the crime scene which leads to various possessions of the victim, and sending in a poem to the LAPD. The targets this murderer is picking out tend to be in shitty relationships, are married or close to people who wear the same size 8 shoe, and have a tendency to get into violent conflicts occasionally, making it very easy to use those people as scapegoats. Additionally, murder weapons and effects of the victim are always found on these suspects, making the act of pinning the blame on them all the more convenient. Cole's partner has warmed up to him at this stage but is still unconvinced that this is the work of a mastermind, instead thinking that this person has been abusing cases of domestic violence to claim glory. As such, the third case winds up putting another guy behind bars who could have easily been the killer, even if some doubt lingers in the background. It's worth noting that Cole's boss is over the moon about all of the positive press coming from these arrests, seeing as they've been painting the homicide division in a very good light. The politics involved come to the forefront slowly but surely, as every case winds up with him congratulating the boys on a job well done, even if the suspect might not really be the guy who's slaying these women. The fourth case is the shoddiest bit of work yet. Victim was fully clothed, rain washed away a lot of the potential evidence, and there was no message or taunting from the murderer. It's easily the worst case from the homicide desk yet, as the intrigue is built up on the victim's husband yet again, only for the blame to fall on a homeless guy who just admits to killing a lot of women. Honestly, with the way that this case played out, it almost felt like filler when compared to the slow but sure ramping up of the events throughout the last three cases. But not every mission can be a slam dunk, I suppose. Fortunately, the fifth case turns up the heat again, splitting into two separate objectives. Objective one would be another dead woman, fully clothed again with no message. But objective two is the fact that the real killer has now pawned the rings of one of the victims who we sent another man away for. So on one hand, we have to solve this new crime, but on the other, we need to figure out if we're being played for fools. What were you doing to the body, Ferdinand? Are you sure you won't be upset? Try me, Ferdinand. I was kissing her. Partway through the investigation, Cole gets called down to the station, where it's revealed that the coroner is having doubts about us catching the right people in the last few cases. Cole's boss and his partner still have doubts, stating that there's enough evidence and motivation. But the coroner reveals that a message was actually left on the inner thigh of the last victim, which means that it's still very possible that these cases are all still connected. So after putting away another possibly innocent suspect, we move on to the crescendo of the homicide desk. The Crescent Moon Murders case kicks off with another letter from our possible killer, one that directs us to a public fountain downtown. Cole's boss isn't too happy with the prospect of the department looking like shit if they free five suspects without the surefire murderer to replace them, which further leans into those politics that were brought up throughout the chapter. The entire case involves a series of action-based platforming, sprinting away from danger and puzzle solving, as the killer has left notes at each location along with the jewelry that he's pilfered from the bodies of his victims. It's kind of a strange quest, one that's half annoying and half inspiring in its intricacies. I said at the start that these guys spent a year and a half just studying LA, and they wanted their efforts to be made known. The notes that you find are poetic in nature, and indirectly speak to a set of seven locations which Cole and his partner head to on this goose chase. The game doesn't tell you where to go, and honestly, if I hadn't played through it before, I would have had a lot harder time remembering if I was looking at the correct landmarks. Fortunately, the devs made this a little easier by showing a photo of each location on the map, even if you didn't discover it before, making this clue trail a bit easier. But this kind of thing lends a huge glob of immersion to L.A. Noir, really putting you in the moment of trying to play this monster's game. Now, the actual navigation through this trap-laden treasure trail is a bit… lacking. The game throws in a couple of unique mechanics, such as swaying a chandelier, balancing on beams, throwing your ass in a circle to prevent a structure from falling, and so on. And none of it is particularly fun to play through, but it is still appreciated in terms of throwing the normal mechanics for a loop. While it's not my favorite climax to all of this, it is done well enough for me to focus more on the sensation of actually tracking the real killer down. When we roll up on an abandoned church, our guy is now waiting for us with a shotgun in hand. Now this is where the game veers more heavily into fiction, as this guy is the Black Dahlia murderer, who was obviously never found in real life. 
Now, I will say that the way that they use this fiction kind of works out. Um, it could be something that actually technically happened. So that is really cool. After chasing him through some catacombs and putting him down, the boss makes it to the scene. Instead of popping the proverbial bottle of champagne, the mood is bleak, as the heavy hand of political interference rings true even at the end of this road. Mason is the half-brother of one of the most highly elected officials in this country. How high? Beyond the moon for mere mortals like us, Rusty. It's an unfortunate bit of reality that smacks Phelps in the face, as his diligence has only been met with disdain from the powers that be. The bad news here is that due to Cole's prodding into secrets which the mighty don't want brought to light, his position as a homicide detective has been deemed a little too risky. The good news on the other hand is that he's technically been promoted to the vice desk due to his efforts, which is a bittersweet dose of medicine that sours the would-be celebrations here. I got better things to be doing than wasting our time on two dead junkies. Did I ask your opinion, detective? Two men dead on US Army issue morphine. That makes it an advice case. Beat it! Yeah. Remember this guy? Say hello again to Roy Earl, who's our newest partner and primo scumbag. The guy's pulled some strings to get you on Vice as his partner, which is going to get messy pretty soon. Administrative Vice is the division of the LAPD which deals with stuff like narcotics, prostitution, gangsters, and so on. Anything that could be deemed an illicit guilty pleasure is the responsibility of Vice, and its close proximity to these enticing allurements only make for an even greater draw of corruption from the officers in the department. And as mentioned previously, this is a terrible fit for the squeaky clean Cole Phelps, or a great fit depending on how you look at it. Detectives Phelps and Earl, LAPD. We're inquiring into the deaths Hand of over the popcorn, numbskull, before we kick the door in. Yeah, things are done a little differently in Vice. Roy's been around for a while and knows a lot of the big players in terms of drug distribution. Cole, of course, wants to know why these drug lords haven't been locked away, and Roy basically tells him that that's not the way things are done. The powerful dealers are able to afford themselves a few extra liberties while the cops look the other way and take out the smaller fry. As such, when you start to follow a trail of government-issued morphine, a few of these criminals will basically state that they've paid their dues to the LAPD. Of course, Roy doesn't deny these accusations, and is instead more pissed off about the criminal even talking about this in the first place so openly. You're a loudmouth motherfucker, aren't you? Anyone ever tell you the criminals are supposed to keep their mouths shut? So here's the hitch with the Vice Desk, which actually affects quite a few cases in this game. L.A. Noir, for the most part, is built on the idea that the player needs to go to certain places in a specific order to get the best outcome. This isn't always the case, but it does happen occasionally, and it's very aggravating when it does. In the example of the first case, I went to one of the dealers before going to another, and the other guy would have given me the information that I needed to get the truth out of the first guy. This means that I literally cannot get a 5-star rating on this case after I'm already 25 minutes into it. Skipping cutscenes is only a thing that you can do sometimes, so it's not an issue of just mashing through 5-10 to 10 minutes of gameplay. So I either take the L or I start over and go to the right location first, despite there being no indicator that there was an order that I should have gone. And I get the idea here. Sometimes real life detectives don't go to the right place first, sure. But when I'm sitting here and quizzing this guy and I realize, ah fuck, I don't have the right evidence, doesn't it seem like a completely reasonable option to say, all right, cuff this guy and we'll take him in and deal with him later? Like, that's a completely normal solution here that could have been implemented instead of punishing the player with their own freedom of choice. Either way, the main difference in the intrigue between Homicide and Vice for me is the shift from tracking a murderer to interacting with openly law-breaking individuals. The conversation here is top-notch, straight out of the movies, and I really enjoy interrogating these smug criminals who think that they've always got a way out. LAPD, we'd like to take a look around. The hell you will, motherfucker. You carrying a warrant? No, do we need one? Take these assholes apart. You heard the boss. God damn. I don't believe this. Are you too good for anything? And when we tell them their good friend Jermaine sent us and said they could do a nice deal for the LAPD. I could use an act like you too. Those fucks Abbott and Costello are on the slide. Hollywood could use another couple of deeply unfunny white bread humps like you. Fuck you, and fuck you. You'll never put a charge on me. 
The music at the Vice desk is also some of my favorite in the game, as the soundtrack shifts from the moody and dramatic homicide track to a more fast-paced jazz tune. This score is great, and I know that I only mentioned it in passing before, but it's perfectly crafted for the moody yet exciting tones of this game. After our first big bust of the stolen government morphine, we move on to the next case involving a crackdown on marijuana. It's pretty by the books as far as the vice desk goes, with a healthy dose of corruption hitting Phelps like a freight train near the end. Roy pockets $1,000 from one of the perpetrators, which Cole berates him over, and the kingpin of the operation is someone who Roy knows and has likely been getting payoffs from. When our new boss marches in to congratulate us, Cole questions him about what will happen to the kingpin, and it becomes pretty obvious that the guy is going to get away with all of this. Reefer is almost as big a threat to the children of this city as communism. Ah, the 40s. Oh well, back to locking up people for life due to government propaganda. Our third vice case starts away from the office for the first time, which I would have liked to see more of. I mean, there's no reason to not show Phelps at home with his wife and him getting a call down into the office because a big crime went down. By the way, did you know that Cole has a wife? Two kids, too. The game mentions them, but you never really see them this far into the game. Hell, you don't see the children at all. There is a partial reason for this which comes up later, but I don't really think it's good enough to justify not showing Cole go home for a bit so that the player can relate to him more. Still, the current case has Phelps and Roy heading out to a boxing match, which Roy has bet big on. When his fighter loses, everyone starts throwing shit at the winner, since he was mostly bet against in the odds. The fighter takes off in a sprint, and the two run after him to see what's going on. Well, Roy here knows exactly what happened, claiming that the winner was supposed to take a fall, and that he and a hundred other people are now out of their betting money. Cole's pissed off and asks Roy if he's more concerned about the obviously illegal prize fighting racket going on here or the fact that he just lost his money, to which Roy scoffs at and ignores. This is the weirdest thing to me. Obviously, Cole despises Roy's actions and attitude. He dislikes the constant dishonesty, the payoffs, the corruption, but he'll still go to a boxing match with him in his off time. He'll ignore the fact that this blatant corruption is happening in front of his eyes. It really clashes with his character, and I wish the devs would have given Cole a little inner monologue for stuff like this to at least somewhat justify his continued involvement with Roy. Either way, one of the crime lords of the area, Mickey Cohen, is down here too. Him and Roy know each other, of course, and Phelps isn't too happy about the threats that Mickey's making towards the winning boxer. After jumping through some hoops, we wind up tracking down the winning boxer, who Roy wants his money from. Cole intervenes and lets the guy go, since he hasn't actually done anything wrong this time. He fought a fair fight, regardless of the past fights, and Roy's infuriated by the idea that he's going to get away after all of this. I gotta say that if you've been responding to the street crimes as they pop up, then Vice is right around the time when you'll start hitting a few of the more interesting ones. For the most part, there's still robberies, shootouts, and the like. But you'll also get missions where you tail a suspect who's rigging a horse race. One where a kid takes off in a police car after phoning in a fake robbery. One where a guy is using this gigantic fucking camera to take pictures up women's skirts. Ah, oh, fuck. And you've got this guy who throws a man off a roof. I can't watch you go around with drunk losers like that anymore, honey. Dudley, I had no idea you felt this way. I won't go through all of them, but it feels like a lot of the good street crimes were backloaded, which is a shitty way to get people to play them. Had I been playing casually, I likely would have just done a couple and stopped after that. Additionally, you can replay street crimes that you've already completed. You want to know how? By driving close to them. No confirmation menu or button press, it just starts if you happen to drive through an intersection that has a street crime on it. How stupid is that shit? I mean, the city is definitely massive, so this isn't going to happen much to you, but it's a really silly way to reinitiate street crimes that you've already played through. Oh, and it gets better. You can also be radioed by HQ to take care of street crimes that you've already done. As long as you happen to drive by an area where they can alert you from, they just beckon you towards them again. So yeah, the moral of the story is that I did 34 out of 40 of these things before calling it quits because I guess these guys just wanted to really beat Bethesda to Skyrim's radiant questing. Either way, we take on a monster of a case before heading into the Vice Desk finale. It's a DLC case, so no overarching connection to the rest of the plot, but it was still pretty fun. What have I done? Didn't see that coming. 
But yeah, Vice Desk was a short three missions before the devs injected some DLC. But that may have actually been due to them worrying about the game not being able to fit on a Blu-ray disc, as that led to Team Bondi cutting a whopping 11 cases across two more desks from L.A. Noir. Though that said, this case and one of the previous cases were pre-ordered DLC also, so I guess that concern wasn't something that stopped the devs entirely. So now we have the final Vice Desk case, which kicks off the beginning of a long end for this game. The problem which arises here is that the morphine is still being distributed on the streets despite our big bust. On top of that, it appears that people are being gunned down over it, so we're trying to get to the bottom of that. This leads us back to the nightclub which Phelps was taken to at the end of the traffic desk cases. In the interim of the mission since then, Cole has occasionally paid a visit to this club, seemingly taking an interest in the singer who's the main act here. That would be the German woman who was smacked around earlier, Elsa Lichtmann. If you care about working in this town, you better give me something on Biddleston and Bo, or their knucklehead buddies Tyree and Lamont. And this is your idea of making inquiries, Undustunfuhre? Elsa's a tough chick, one who's extraordinarily defensive during questioning, as she refuses to give up anything that could get her into trouble with this whole morphine business. This is where things take a turn, as Cole tells Roy that he wants to take the rest of the night to try something on his own before proceeding further into the casework. Yeah, it turns out that Cole's been having an affair with Elsa here, which Roy finds out after tailing Cole to her home. I think this would be the reason why we don't see the wife. I imagine to keep Cole's good guy persona front and center for as long as possible. But I would think that showing the two having a relationship, even a rocky one, would have made for a much bigger pang of betrayal and an overall better story. Every citizen in America is against prostitution, Phelps. We can't expect to come out of this unscathed. We should change the law! Are you out of your mind? Exactly. We should legalize prostitution. Oh my god, why did I think of this sooner? Phelps, I don't think that's- Okay, if we start a hashtag trending and make it a women's rights thing- This is a really bad idea, Phelps. Rusty! How do you feel about legalizing hookers? Our trail leads through some of the biggest players for the rest of the game. And I know that this might be a weird place to insert this, but I think now's the time to talk about Cole's past as a primer for what's to come. So Cole's history throughout his time with the Marines is sprinkled into the beginning of a lot of these cases as flashbacks, displaying more scenes of his golden boy attitude clashing with Kelso's disdain for authority under a regime of meritocracy. I particularly like the scene where the platoon is getting ready to have a vacation-type weekend, only to have the commanding officer march in and further beat down on Kelso's reputation by blaming him for the trip being cancelled. Kelso, this carbine. The bore is dirty. No, it isn't. Are you arguing with me, Kelso? Do what you need to do, Sergeant. You know the bore is immaculate. Weekend liberty cancelled. Two-day field drill. Clean this rifle. No. As the backstory progresses to the actual fighting, you get to see a little more of who exactly Cole Phelps is. He insists on being addressed as lieutenant even in the midst of a firefight. His squad tends to give him flack for being so tightly wound. He speaks fluent Japanese to his prisoners, and explains that he respects Japan and its people, claiming that the United States would have gone to war with a country if that nation cut off its oil supply also. And many of the other soldiers despise him for this kind of attitude. They view him as a goody two-shoes who doesn't actually know how to lead, his efficient nature clashing with the messy reality of war. This efficiency brings about the very thing that Kelso criticized Phelps for before, in which Cole is more concerned about following his orders to the letter, and getting a lot of his men killed in the process. Kelso, on the other hand, proves to be an excellent natural-born leader, one who can speak to his men with a mix of honesty and hopefulness which pushes them to get through this shit, proving the uselessness of the previous aptitude tests which he and the rest of the Corps were subjected to. Eventually, we meet up with another pivotal character in the upcoming story, Courtney Sheldon. Sheldon was a medic out on the front lines of the war, and he was amazingly diligent at throwing himself into the middle of a firefight to help the wounded. Most of the time, though, it wasn't to save them, but to put them out of their misery. Sheldon claims that it's the only thing that he can do to ease the suffering a lot of the time, and Phelps is immediately disgusted by it, calling him a murderer. The finale of Cole's time fighting overseas is spent in a vicious battle that raged through the night. At one point, an artillery strike hit the guy next to Phelps directly, blowing him to bits. This understandably put the fear of God in Cole, and he spent the rest of the night unmoving in a severe state of shell shock. In the morning, Kelso finds Cole, which leads to this scene. It's over, Cole. Looks like you're one of the lucky ones. 
Say goodbye to your friend Hank, Jack. Are you wounded? Not a scratch, Kelso. Well, get up and get out of that fucking hole! God damn it, we have beaten these bastards back. It's the beginning of the end, and it was one here. You're a goddamn hero, son. What's your name? Lieutenant Phelps, sir. I'm recommending you for the Silver Star and promoting you to first lieutenant. This scene expertly paints why Cole is so hesitant to talk about the war, why he denies being a hero when people call him that. And it showcases the final grain of hatred falling into the hourglass of Kelso's disgust with Cole Phelps. A lot of Cole's character in the war translates directly to how straightforward he is when doing casework for the LAPD. It's strange because a lot of the time when you're playing a Rockstar game, the character that you're playing as is relatable more often than not. Sure, they usually get wrapped up in some shady business or outright criminal activity, but you wind up feeling for them. You get to know their personality and become invested in their growth as a person. Cole Phelps, on the other hand, is probably the coldest protagonist that you'll play in these types of games. Yes, he's mostly a good guy. Yes, he's efficient to a staggering degree. But his approach to everything is through the eyes of someone who has seen death. Who has emotions, sure, but keeps them buttoned up when on the job. Hello, Rusty. Two on your usual lane? I'm Detective Phelps. Homicide. You must be new. <laughs> What's your shoe size? We're conducting an investigation, ma'am. Do you know the name Evelyn Summers? It makes for some really tone-deaf moments from him, as his all-business persona tends to cut like a knife through people who have had their worlds turned upside down. And I'm not saying that Cole's wrong to proceed about his job that way. Hell, I'd say that more often than not, he tends to get answers that he otherwise wouldn't by always staying professional. But again, it makes him pretty damn hard to relate to him with what he's been through during the war being the biggest asset that props up any relatability to him. Throughout the game are newspapers which you can pick up to reveal a bit of the side story mostly involving Courtney Sheldon and what he did after the war. The front end of these newspapers take place in the office of Harlan Fontaine, who's employed Sheldon as his assistant. The psychiatrist is taken to giving out morphine to help the veterans of the war to calm down. Of course, these sessions have done little to treat the PTSD which many vets have faced, and instead have caused them to become dependent on the doctor to get their fix. That's not all that Fontaine has gotten himself up to, though. As in one scene, he's coaxed one of his patients who wanted to set a house on fire to go through with the act, convincing the patient that the house was empty. That house was not empty, leading to the patient calling the doctor while freaking out. At this stage, Sheldon wants out, but not from being associated with Fontaine. You see, Courtney's as naive as they come. He's a good guy who wants to see the war vets taken care of, but he doesn't have a clue about how to go about it. So what he did was steal a shitload of morphine from the US government and began trying to use it to both help the servicemen who needed it and to sell it so that he could help as many vets as possible. This got him into the game of dealing morphine, which is headed up by the gangster Mickey Cohen. After the mobster tries to buy the remaining supply from Courtney directly, Mickey decides to order Sheldon to be killed after his refusal to make the deal. So Courtney has Kelso help him to get away from this business, which leads to a pretty badass scene between the mobster and the war veterans. We made a mistake and would like to back out gracefully. If you come after us, we will be forced to come after you. You've been polite up till now, so don't stop making threats. I don't make threats, Mr. Cohen. I'd like to thank you for your time. Is that guy your idea, muscle kid? <laughs> There's something you should know about Jack, Mr. Cohen. He kills six Japs hand to hand with just a bayonet and a K-bar knife. His outfit, the six Marines, killed over 100,000 Japs in three months in Okinawa, and he was in the thick of it. Those Japs are little guys, right? Yes, Mr. Cohen, about your size. This initiates a pushback from the gangsters who begin pressing him for the rest of his stash, which Courtney decides to ultimately confide in Harlan Fontaine. You can practically see the light bulb go off over Fontaine's head, as he then persuades Courtney to give him the rest of his morphine, stating that he'll administer it medically to those who need it, and that he'll then invest the profits into the housing market so that the veterans can have homes. Courtney is again naively relieved by this, his idealistic attitude getting the best of him once more. And now we can spin back to the case at hand. So Cole and Roy head down to meet with Mickey Cohen, who obviously denies being involved in anything related to morphine. 
but this conversation potentially triggers an explosion of shootings across the city. As Mickey's goons are now trying to annihilate any of the former Marines who were on the ship which contained the morphine. Multiple shooters wielding machine guns start unloading on anyone who they know came off that boat, causing Phelps to have to intervene. This leads us on a trail which points towards both Kelso and Sheldon being involved, and likewise leads to very tense interviews with both. Yeah, and what's in it for you, Cole? Newspapers? More glory? Another promotion? Another medal at the expense of men who fought for their country? Count me out. Mid-investigation, we're also hit with another absolute powder keg of a newspaper story, which tells you exactly what Roy did with the information of Cole's infidelity. Basically around this time in real life history, there was a huge scandal involving a sex worker who wound up being involved with the LAPD's sergeants of the vice desk at the time. The story was huge when it broke, and the game portrays that initial investigation as a gigantic shitstorm that's about to hit the department in earnest. Roy's solution to that is pitching the New York Times a story about Cole and Elsa in order to stave off further inquiry into the sex worker's situation for now, which is an excellent way to work a historical event like this into your game. Now Sheldon's interview is a different kind of tense. First off, Fontaine is here and not removed from the interview room for some reason, but Cole lays it on thick, guilting the shit out of Courtney for getting so much of his former unit killed over this morphine. Right as Sheldon is about to break down, the LAPD commissioner busts in before dressing him down in front of Courtney and the doctor. Yep, this is the reckoning of Cole at the hands of his own decisions. And it's such a mixed bag of emotions. Part of me is angry that the ever-opportunistic Roy ratted out Cole. Another part of me hates that the LAPD would do this to a guy who has constantly cracked cases and thrown himself into hellfire just to cover their own corrupt asses. But most of me feels like total shit knowing that Cole did this to himself. And I have to wonder if the way that this all went down was intentionally written to hit these exact emotions. Because like I said, I think that seeing some scenes where Cole takes care of his family, spends time with his wife, or even gets closer to Elsa would have been a better way to go. But Cole's such a plain, uptight character. If the devs had thrown in these scenes, I could easily see the player hating him. But if he had been a bit more charismatic and more interesting in a way that made him more than his past, I think that those scenes wouldn't have warranted as angry of a response. So as things stand, I'd say that if you wanted to make Cole the way that he is, and mix his cheating with his past of being an arrogant prick in the war only to be seen as a glory-hogging coward by the rest of his unit, then not sticking in these other backing scenes would probably be the better way to go about salvaging any likability and relatability of Cole as a person. And now we kick off the finale of the game, which has Cole demoted to the arson desk. Everyone makes fun of him and generally treats him like complete shit, as you might expect. How'd you like parking that German whore, Phelps? How long have you been working, Arson? We gonna do the small talk thing now? Talk baseball, exchange addresses? I don't think so. Feeling down, hotshot? Need a buddy? I'll look somewhere else. Mike Brannigan, Cole Phelps. I feel sorry for your wife and kids, Phelps, not for you. It's a really interesting direction for the finale of a game. Sure, there have been plenty of games where you continually rise in the ranks or have a fall halfway through only to claw your way back up to the top. But like I said, this is the last swath of content in the game, which is unique, but maybe not unique enough to keep the player from feeling like shit. Yeah, there's still motive to try to rise back up again, but I think that playing through this game a second time really sapped my desire to begin the arson cases just because I know how all of this goes down. So Cole investigates potential cases of arson on the arson desk. Surprising, I know. But he's trying extra hard now to make it big in this department in order to stick it to his superiors who demoted him. I actually wonder if his first case on the arson desk turning out to be a very run-of-the-mill accident would have made for a better story. Everyone's making fun of him, he's trying his best, and he starts to look like a nut job to everyone around him when he keeps trying to crack conspiracies about these house fires. Then after that, he actually does stumble into a big criminal case. It might have not been the most fun to play through, but the character development here would have been top notch. Either way, what we do get is a heap of arson that's seemingly been committed by a housing development firm who wants to push people out of their homes so that they can rebuild on top of the empty lots. This has us shaking down some employees of a heater installation firm. Instead, he hires arsonists, does it? I've worked as a fitter all my life. Put everything I had into that house and my fucking mud shark of a wife gets awarded it in the settlement. Yeah, I burnt it all right. Set fire to that fucker and watch it burn to the ground. I did my time and I'd do it again. Sorry about the rouse, Clemens. 
you did the right thing. So this entire case doesn't really have a right or wrong answer. You wind up with two suspects who look pretty equally guilty. But the bigger message here to me is why this may have happened in the first place. With nearly any big company that we've had to deal with in these cases, there almost always seems to be a motive in the bottom line of the business. I mean, it makes sense, obviously. But you hear about a lot of these criminals gaining access to the tools that they need to commit their crimes because companies have been stretched thin. They hire people with shady pasts. Anyone who will really take the job, basically. Demand has skyrocketed for housing and everything that comes with it, causing businesses like the heater company to intentionally use older model parts with their newer models, which have been known to cause fires through defects. The machine of capitalism demands that these businesses do whatever it takes to keep the profits flowing as fast as they will flow, and that greed leads to a lot of corners being cut in this era of US history. And of course, if anyone gets upset that people die or their lives are ruined and start complaining about the system, they're labeled as a commie and locked up. That's the American way. You remember the newspaper bit where it's revealed that one of Fontaine's patients was expressing remorse at burning down a house with the family inside? Well, there's a follow-up bit here that's related to our work on the arson desk. There wasn't a correct answer in the first case because this guy who the doctor initially inspired to light these fires is the one committing these acts of arson. In this new scene, we have the guy calling the doctor again, claiming that he understands that his purpose is to now unite families in heaven by killing them with fire. Fontaine insists that the guy come back for therapy, but it's evident that he's too far gone at this stage to talk any sense into him. Either way, this whole string of arson leads all the way to the top, as further investigation has us shaking down a very close friend of the mayor and chief of police. This guy's in charge of building new homes for GIs returning from the war. And although he doesn't give us anything concrete, it becomes very apparent that he doesn't enjoy being needled with questions about build quality or the idea that his company is using fire to push people out of their homes who refuse to sell. Did you know that I'm on the board of the police pension fund? This vague threat next manifests when Roy pays a visit to Phelps to warn him to back off of the housing development business, claiming that they're powerful people. The case is officially moved over to homicide, which means that we wind up putting the blame on another well-known firebug. Cole's new boss is happy with the results, reprimanding him for initially going after the housing company. What were you thinking, Phelps? We'll be calling Richard Nixon a crook next. <laughs> the conclusion of this case has Cole returning back home to Elsa, who's recently been named the sole beneficiary of a friend of hers who died in a workplace accident for the same housing development company that Cole's been looking into. He urges Elsa to not accept the money, and to instead bend Jack Kelso's ear about possible corruption. I never mentioned this, but Kelso actually works for an insurance company that deals with fires specifically. Since Cole has hit a dead end, he figures that Kelso would be willing to sniff out the corruption from his end. Turns out that that hunch is exactly right, as the game now has you piloting Kelso when Elsa comes in to reject the payment offer. After getting chewed out by his boss for questioning why Elsa would reject the payment on grounds of corruption, Kelso heads down to the site where the supposed accident happened, only to find out that the wood being used for this new house was from a film studio and definitely not up to safety standards. That's when this guy tries to kill Jack with a fucking bulldozer. Instead of moving off to the side, Jack runs down a narrow ditch that can only fit him and the dozer in it, which is, um... Probably the most video gamey thing to happen in L.A. Noir, and that's saying a lot after the murder finale. After this silliness is over, Kelso continues his investigation, which leads him to discovering a film reel with the Hollywood elite discussing them obviously taking advantage of the war's end to line their pockets. Basically, what these guys are doing is building really shitty homes out of flimsy bargain bin materials and then lighting them on fire to claim massive amounts of insurance money. When Kelso meets up with Elsa to discuss what he's found, Cole happens to be dropping by to see her on her break. The two don't see each other, but Cole sees Kelso talking to his girl. Cole then decides that after pointing Elsa towards Jack, he was now going to throw a jealous fit about Elsa meeting with him in a back alley. Which only really further reveals the kind of man that Phelps is, continuing to degrade any good feelings that the player may have about him. Of course, Elsa refutes that anything extra is going on and the two proceed to fuck in the back alley. Guess that's why he was worried about it. Kelso continues to hunt down evidence like a bloodhound, which gets him in the hot water when he gets jumped by men hired by the head housing bitch from before. After escaping from the trunk of a car and outrunning the pursuers, Jack books it to Elsa's apartment where he passes out after seeing Cole. 
When Kelso wakes up in his hospital bed, Elsa is sitting on the windowsill next to him. There is immediate romantic tension between the two, despite this being their third meeting, which is a weird part of the story that doesn't ever really bear fruit beyond showing that Elsa might not be as loyal to Cole as you might think. Kelso also gets visited by the assistant DA, who's ready to try to clean up the city's corruption. He starts this process by bestowing a private investigator badge onto Jack, who gets to work immediately by visiting his former boss who is in on all of this insurance and construction fraud. After booting a 12-year-old girl out of his bed, Jack raids the place for evidence, confronts his former boss verbally and a little physically, and then turns back to Phelps for help. The two kind of hash out their differences in a very brief chat about the past. It doesn't lead too far, but it does at least break the tension between these two former brothers in arms. You're still beating yourself up over that medal on Sugarloaf. The medal you think you didn't deserve, but you just don't get it. Nobody deserves a medal. It's just the ridiculous situation you find yourself in and how you react to it. You think you failed up on that hill. But courage isn't a tap you can turn on or off. Courage isn't permanent. It's a tenuous and fickle thing. Courage and cowardice exist in every man. Get over it. From here, Jack heads over to the Hall of Records, which actually turns into a really cool technical display of how the records were kept on various businesses and properties at the time. You basically have this big scrolling sheet of paper to pinpoint coordinates. Then you have to convert any lot number by dividing it into a different number. That letter is then converted into a letter of the alphabet, which you have to find the proper set of records for. Maybe that's not the most inherently fascinating set of tasks, but I found it really cool personally. The main thing that we find out here besides confirming exactly what's happening with the housing fund is that Courtney Sheldon is listed as an investor in this whole operation. Confronting him about this makes it very plain that he had no idea that he was a part of all of this. Kelso breaks the news to him that his morphine operation hasn't gone towards helping out the veterans the way that he believed it would, and that Fontaine has been taking him for a ride this whole time. So what does Courtney go and do with this new nugget of information? Yeah, he goes back to Fontaine and he goes, oh, Holy shit, Doc, we've been duped! And this oven problem is still bothering you? <sighs> I just... <sighs> Why do they call it oven when you ove in the cold food of out hot eat the food? And you cannot believe that I'm the source of this knowledge. <sighs> I don't know what to believe anymore, Doctor. I hope that you weren't involved. Thank you for your trust, dear boy. It's an old man, a retired cop of pasta. Some think of the future, Courtney. Metal Gear Rising, that new Sonic game, paintings by AI. There, there, dear boy. They'll never use this facial capture technology again. Far too expensive. And now it's time for Jack and some of his war buddies to raid the head housing bitch's mansion. This is one of the big rock star finale shootouts that always seem to pop up in their games, and goes about as you would expect. Though there is one point where Big Kelso busts in on some secretary type woman. A very sweet looking girl to be holding such a big gun. I know how to use it, mister. I'm sure you do. So how about pointing it over there in the direction of Hollywood instead of at me, princess? You're quite the wise guy. I don't normally shoot women, princess. How about putting the cannon down? Ah! Oh. I was never very good at reading women. Oh man, you mean to tell me that giving random women pet names gives you Redditor level charisma? God damn it, I'm gonna have to change my approach. At least Jack makes up for it with this pretty Chad-level entry on Big Boss here. Jack Kelso. That's my opening negotiating position. <laughs> so not too much more information that we didn't already know or assume to some degree comes from raiding this room. The bigger thing that does come up is that Elsa's been kidnapped by Fontaine's ice... Isis? Holy shit. Wow, that, that took a hard turn. The bigger thing that does come up though is that Elsa's been kidnapped by Fontaine's arsonist, the guy who believed that he was sending families to be happier in heaven. And this is where the game would normally spin into its last mission, but there's actually one last slice of DLC to tackle first. As Jack is doing his thing, the devs thought that they would cook up something for Phelps to do. And that happened to be a case based off of the explosion of the O'Connor Electroplating Company in 1947. This explosion was an incident that occurred when the plant was experimenting with a new way to chemically polish aluminum, which had always been done by hand up until this point. 
In the game version of these events, we see the explosion as it happens, which is fucking awesome. I actually thought it was going to be a joke DLC at first, like the Russians were invading or something. And honestly, I'll bet that's what a lot of people in the vicinity thought when this whole thing went down. We have looters around the corner. Cuff them or put them down. We need to get this area under control. Now ain't the time to be looking for a profit, asshole! Wow, people looting small businesses during a terrible situation and the police responding with lethal force. Thank God we don't live in those times anymore. Either way, we get to exploring the wreckage, and the devs decided to shake up this explosion business a little more by sprinkling in a bit of espionage when we find a suitcase belonging to a Japanese scientist that seems to have spy equipment in it, along with a coded message. We trace the spy's address and hoof it over to her apartment, which has been turned upside down. You think I could fit in there? I couldn't fit in there. I'd like to think you would have had something more to say about getting shoved in a fridge, Herschel. This whole mission leads into a pretty fun but not particularly noteworthy case. With it being DLC, they didn't really do too much for the plot here, instead making it a one-off that stands on its own. I just think it probably would have been better off if they had placed it earlier in the quest order, rather than right as things were ramping up with Kelso. Either way, let's turn the page to the final case of the game. The opening scene has the game shedding a little light on what happened between Fontaine and Elsa. Basically, there's one thing that you need to know that I haven't revealed about Fontaine yet. His chair. Yes, Fontaine's chair is actually enchanted. I know, I know, but hear me out. Every single time someone has sat in the chair across from Fontaine, they've never been able to get back up or look behind them in any way without his permission. It's a mystical artifact. I believe it also grants plus two willpower and minus two intelligence if I got the stat sheet right. Either way, Fontaine doesn't decide to Cosby Elsa like he did with Courtney, instead opting for a more direct approach. <laughs> so where does Fontaine's pocket arsonist come in? Well, he busts through the window like Donkey Kong, snaps Fontaine's neck like a toothpick, and then carries off Elsa. Fortunately, Jack is on the case and is actively tracking this guy on his end. Along the way, we find my absolute favorite newspaper story in this game, which details Phelps finding Sheldon's body dumped in a parking lot with a morphine surette sticking out of his neck. I'll just let this one play out a bit. Get away from him, Phelps. This is my case. Shut your fucking mouth. I knew this creep wasn't on the morphine heist. Victim of his own product. Hey, detective! Can we back it off a notch? This is getting out of hand. It's a time to talk and a time to shut up. Now is the time to be quiet, son. Courtney Sheldon was a corpsman, Roy. He served his country. He went out with a medical kit and an Army 45 into places that made the Valley of Death look like a picnic. He was either naive enough or dumb enough to get involved in the Suburban Redevelopment Fund, along with the mayor, the DA, Monroe, and a certain crooked cop. He was involved in the morphine heist, but he has a puncture wound in his jugular, which makes this a murder case. He was a better man than you'll ever know. You say one more word about him and I will blow your fucking head off! This is easily the most emotion that we've seen out of Cole for the entirety of this game up until this point. It's an awesomely powerful scene, and it actually won me back a little more towards liking Cole as a person. Speaking of, Cole finally cracks exactly what these guys were planning on doing with the housing. Their scheme here is to buy out all of the property possible along the future construction site of the new freeway that will run down the middle of LA. Then they build their shitty houses on the line by using their infinite money glitch to burn and rebuild with payouts from insurance. And then they collect a huge sum of money from the government when they offer to buy out the land for the freeway. God damn, son. After Kelso gets done bleeding all over every pest control office in the region, he gets the address of the maniac arsonist and heads out. Well, it turns out that Kelso and Phelps both knew this guy. His name was Ira, and he was on flamethrower duty during the war. After figuring out that the guy took to the sewers, Jack calls it in to Phelps, which immediately puts him on the radar of every corrupt cop in the city. Phelps and Biggs do their best to aid Kelso in getting to the sewers, while also invoking the ire of the dirty officers. It's a hell of a finale as the rain pours into the streets of LA resulting in the two former comrades making it to the sewers with the help of the assistant DA. After a bit of sewer fighting against the crooked cops, we finally make it to Ira, who only wanted to protect Elsa. This is probably one of the more powerful scenes in any Rockstar published game for me personally. I mean, there are definitely comparable ones that are at or above the same level, but this one really stuck with me. 
Ira here lost his mind in Okinawa after Phelps ordered him to clear out a cave that happened to be filled with women and children. He's been stuck on that island mentally ever since, every day haunting him in a way that would never see his life return to any semblance of normalcy. I was proud to serve with you, Jack. This leads us into the final flashback, which shows the aftermath of the destruction that Ira caused with his flamethrower. Phelps tries his best to not freak out and orders his men to put down those still alive humanely. We are leaving this place. You do it, Phelps. Get your own fucking hands dirty. Ah! I'm on a morphine. Ah! Help! The pain that's on display here is profound, and I think it does a brilliant job of displaying what a lot of real-world Marines had to go through during World War II. Eventually, Sheldon loses it and shoots Phelps in the back. Kelso orders that they evacuate him, effectively saving Cole's life and showcasing his true feelings towards him. The final scene has a torrent of water rushing towards the three in the sewers at an alarming rate. Cole helps to boost Elsa up to Biggs first, followed by Kelso. With no one to push him up, Cole utters one last goodbye before he gets swept away by a violent cascade of water, killing him. It's probably the most sudden and unexpected death scene that I can recall from a game, and I remember feeling robbed the first time that I played it. But after replaying the game, I think this ending is about as perfect as you could plan it if you wanted to proceed with the game the way that the devs wanted to tell the story. I'm not saying that this is the only way that it could have went down, but without restructuring a significant portion of the game's story, I think this is the best way that it could have finished. Team Bondi had a very specific goal in mind with this game, and that's only hammered home when the final scene displays Cole's funeral, his casket surrounded by some of the most corrupt people in the entire story. Roy gives a speech about what a great man that Cole was, claiming that the rumors of his infidelity were false and that he was a hero for sticking to his work so diligently. Of course, the people who are in attendance know better, but all of them are silent besides Elsa, who screams at him before stomping off. The game closes on a new regime being instated into the elite of Los Angeles, with them tossing Fontaine and the head housing bitch under the bus as the source of corruption. Biggs and Jack share a final word about Cole never being Jack's friend, but never being his enemy either. It's one of the most human endings that I've ever seen written into a video game, and it comes with so many mixed emotions about who these people were and where everything wound up. L.A. Noir is one of the most poignant demonstrations of an era in U.S. history that people know of but don't really think about anymore. Its prominent tones of uncertainty, corruption, and bleakness mingle expertly with the fast-paced and cheery facade of a time when a new city was being built into the titan that people know it as today. Everything about it is a love letter to this distant time 75 years ago when the American way was touted as the example to live by when the white picket fences of something bold and new was heavily advertised by the corporate machine to the country's people. So much of this handcrafted scenery starts as awe-inspiring, before giving way to the grime and muck of a shady city polluted by the worst criminal elements and enhanced by corporations which feed into it and on it. Battling against much of the seedier elements of the City of Angels is the LAPD and people like Cole Phelps. Phelps might be one of the coldest and most unapproachable Rockstar game protagonists ever, even if you can attribute his writing to Team Bondi. Likewise, his character arc doesn't really help to warm him up to the player in a conventional way. He starts as a diligent officer who is a master at his craft. His promotion sees him continuing to rise as someone capable and reliable. Then his background story starts to punch holes in his persona, showing off who he was and how it's led to who he is now. He begins cheating on his wife while not really addressing that he fucked up. He continues to push for glory in the LAPD, even if that glory is a byproduct of doing what's right. He's a very tough character to break down, and part of me wonders if that's because the writers intentionally left out his home life, his personal interests, and what he does in his free time. You don't go to the movies on a date. You don't play poker with the boys. You don't head to a restaurant to eat and it's tough to feel for someone that you can't relate to on a more human level. If the story hadn't played out exactly the way that it did, I would say that Cole Phelps is a poorly written protagonist. But it's like the devs took this very narrow slice of humanity and built around it. The cases that he works, the way that he responds to various prejudices, how he talks to the people around him, and most importantly, the actions that make up who Cole is. All of these facets to what make a protagonist are heightened and focused on to a staggering degree. One that makes the player feel bad for him in the end, and ultimately makes him much more human than you'd ever imagine him to turn out. Cole's intensity is seen as him grasping for glory by most until they get to know him. 
And while you could say that Biggs is the superlative example of this change in attitude, I would say that Kelso is. For so many years, Jack Kelso saw Phelps as someone who stole valor from the rest of his men, whose actions got so many killed, whose incessant need to follow protocol caused more harm than good. But at the very end, Kelso saw Phelps as a damned good detective, as one of the most positive parts of the crime-ridden LA, and as a hero in his own way. He realized that Phelps was just a human being trying his best, and eventually let go of a grudge years in the making. The attitudes of Kelso and these other people surrounding Cole accentuate his gravitational pull towards him as someone reliable and trustworthy, which only further augments his adultery as a black mark on his character. The mechanics of this game are a mixed bag of innovation and tried and true, with the interrogation and clue searching systems being front and center the way that they ought to be. These mechanics truly make LA Noir what it is, and their exclusion would have been a gigantic loss. The shooting and driving mechanics are very much old Rockstar game procedure, and while I can't really say much bad about them, I can't come up with too much good about them either. But the intricate architecture of Bondi's LA is astonishing at times. Setting aside the older textures and the like, the sheer amount of detail in the building interiors, the framework of the city, and the architectural layout of the streets is immaculate. There are few games that I can point towards that reflect the amount of meticulous planning that LA Noir exudes at any given moment. But that said, with the way that these cases are structured, I felt no desire to explore the city, which is the biggest flaw for the amount of planning that went into it. You can't stop by a coffee shop, or get a bite to eat, or peruse a clothing store. There are no attractions beyond the occasional landmark, hidden car, or street crime. And even then, the street crimes only pulled me in because the game advertised them at you. They weren't particularly compelling. The system surrounding them was shitty, and it only made me want to work the case more without taking the time to observe the bustling flow of the city proper. The story of LA Noir and its characters is one of the brightest spots in an already shining game. The way that they talk, the motives that they have, and the backstories that they bring to the table are phenomenal, so much so that I wanted more out of them at nearly any given moment. I wanted to see more of Cole's life, what made Roy the way that he is, how Elsa escaped Germany, what Biggs did in the Marines, how Courtney did at school, what Kelso did when he made it back. And while I would normally critique a game for not including more of this stuff, I do think that these guys wanted to tell their one story path and leave the rest to the player's imagination. The tie-ins to past events, the raw displays of human emotion during one of humanity's darkest hours, the consuming hunger of the underbelly of LA, all of it is superb. It's a good thing to want more when it's all over, and I can't stress how well done this game's writing is at its highest points. So is LA Noir as good as I remember? Hell yeah it is. It's every bit as good as I remember. Any game that leaves you wanting more the way that this game does is a good game. And even now it makes me pine for more 1940s based detective drama. I do hope that Rockstar eventually dusts off this idea once more. It might be too much to ask for with their consistent GTA 5 schedule, but I really do think that a sequel or prequel would really flourish in this day and age. Thanks for watching. I had much more fun with this one than I thought I would, even if it was a bit more bleak than what I would usually take on. I'm unsure what I'll be hitting next, but it will be a video game. Until then, I've got merch on my merch shop, probably. I know that might sound strange, but I assure you that it's true. I've got a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where I post the latest video and sometimes other things. I've got a Discord where it's all other things all the time. And I've got a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.